A few months back, officials at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada announced a hiring blitz. It was an acknowledgement that they needed immediate help dealing with a backlog of more than 2 million immigration applications. But for international students hoping to stay and skilled workers aiming to convert to permanent resident status, the backlog means limbo and sometimes worse. With us on Where Things Stand Now, let's welcome, in Waterloo, Ontario, Mikhail Skuterud, economics professor at the University of Waterloo and director of the Canadian Labour Economics Forum. And here in our studio, immigration lawyers, Elizabeth Long, partner at Long Mangelji LLP, and Lev Abramovich, a partner at Abramovich and Chern. And we're delighted to welcome you two here in our studio. And Mikhail, good to have you on the line from Waterloo. I want to start, Elizabeth, just with the latest, the latest data that I just brought up. Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada says the backlog's 2.6 million people. Right. Let's start with what that actually means for that 2.6 million. Effectively, what does it mean? Well, the 2.6 million people covers a lo uh, everyone between uh, people who are trying to come into the country with workers and students and visitors who are trying to visit their families um, and trying to get the visitor visas to those people who are applying for permanent residence. Um, it covers, um, for example, people in uh, who have applied under the caregiver program. Many of those people who are applying under those programs since it started in 2019 have not yet even had their applications processed. Three years they've been waiting. Three years, and hmm. that affects people here who are looking for people to help their children and take care of their children. You know, if someone was just born, they would have already been in preschool. Maybe they might be in kindergarten by the time <laughs> we can bring some people over. Or companies who are trying to hire workers, needed workers. We have seen backlogs right now of 35 weeks or more at um, visa posts like Singapore or uh, or uh, Dubai. Um, India before was experienced a huge backlog. Now they've sort of um, eased it a little bit, but it's still, we're seeing months and months to process workers. Okay, let me get to McCall on the follow-up. I mean, obvious follow-up question is, why is the backlog so long? Why is this taking so long? I think the, if you're asking me what the cause of the backlog is, I, I track these numbers at least in the what's called the express entry system. That's the system we use to admit per, new permanent residents, as distinct from you know these visitors and the temporary foreign workers. So the new new permanent residents, you, you know, you can see very cl clearly that the backlog really began in February of 2021 when the government decided to empty the express entry pool, sort of do away with the system they've been using and the way it was set up to be used for many years um, in order to reach an immigration target in 2021. So I, I think that's the way I see it. it. It looks pretty clear in the data that we can trace it back to February 2021 in the in the permanent resident uh, class. And, and, and so that, I think that's the cause, essentially. And McCall, is, was there anything special going on in Feb 21 that would have accounted for this? Well, I mean, the cynical view is that we know the deputy minister is incentivized through bonuses to hit these targets. I mean, there are mandate letters given from the prime minister to to, to the, the bureaucrats within the IRCC to, to hit the targets. And and those, you know, if you think about the fiscal year, when the fiscal year ends, you know, their time was running out to, to hit these targets. Um, and it was a tough time. I mean, this is COVID. I mean, normally hitting the target would not be that hard. But the problem was that getting the, the focus Folks to actually land in Canada, um, you, you, you needed with it, with the travel restrictions. You needed to give the, the the invitations to the people who were already here, and 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 that's tricky because knowing which of the applicants are actually on Canadian soil is not straightforward in the data that IRCC has. And so it it, it became an uh, basically they went within one program. It's called the CEC Canadian Experience Class, and they literally invited pretty much everybody who had applied in that program for to to they accepted. To, they gave them an invitation for permanent residency at one point in time. Hmm. Okay, that you, we've talked about express entry as one program. Lev, I want to talk to you about another program called Temporary Resident to Permanent Resident Pathway Program. How does that? What's that about? How does that work? Right. Well, before we talk about that, um, hmm. we need to probably clarify what we uh, mean when we say backlog. So currently, there are about 2.6 million applications that are pending. Not all of them constitute a backlog. Why not? Properly, a backlog is an application that is pending beyond the reasonable service time or the service time, the standard service time provided by RCC. 
So out of the 2.6 million, you have about a million and a half that are properly backlogged. The rest are inventory. You're always going to have inventory, right? That's how the system runs. So it's number one. Regarding so, sorry, just so I understand. So are you saying it's actually not as bad as it looks? No, it's it's pretty bad. One point one one and a half million applications uh, that are pending, and those are permanent residency, temporary residency, citizenship, as Elizabeth has said. That that's a pretty bad number. However, not every pending application is delayed necessarily, and therefore, when we use the word backlog. We have to be mindful between the difference between inventory. If I submit an application tomorrow, I'm technically in the inventory, but I'm not a but part of not the a backlog, backlog. Okay. Because it typically takes 60 days to process the application, and on day 61, technically that application becomes backlog. So okay. we understand so the number distinction one. there. Okay. Number two, with respect to the question that you asked, Mikhail, if I could just add, I think. The major causes of the backlogs, outside of you know some policy that perhaps was driven by numbers and politics as opposed to sort of other considerations, if you will, um, is an archaic immigration system that relies on consular posts. So that's a problem. Is an archaic backhand with respect to processing software that doesn't work, portals that constantly crash, complete lack of transparency and accountability on that front. You mix in political pressures, you mix in lack of remote work arrangements. You mix in workers being off when COVID hit, when the rest of us were trying to do our job, adjusting. We went to fully remote, big companies, consulting companies like PwC, KPMG, all had to adjust. They sort of operate on the scale of IRCC. They don't do that because there isn't, I guess, the incentive, there isn't the culture, there isn't the leadership, and so on. So they don't make those changes. And applications are pending and pending and pending and pending and pending and pending, and a backlog is created. And you add to that the, the PR um, draw on February 13th, where they essentially emptied the Canadian uh, experience class category with an express entry and so on. But there are also PR structural permanent residence. Yeah, but there are also structural issues that we must talk about because it's not all just sort of policy and, and bad okay. decisions. Before you get there, I want to have Elizabeth comment on that. An archaic system. Mm -hmm. Software that doesn't work, people who didn't want to go to work, does mm -hmm. this all, political pressure, does this all ring true to you as well? Yes, absolutely. We currently have the system where everyone is supposed to submit their applications online. Fantastic. Um, a, that there, there are issues. I mean, oftentimes we're trying to um, log into the website and most half the time it crashes, right? Um, but there is also an issue where we're still using our, even though we are able to submit everything online, they're still sending all these applications to the different visa posts. So they have to be concerned with hiring officers in different countries. There's no need for this. Instead, we can hire inside Canada, create Canadian jobs, and have officers specialize in deciding applications inside Canada. Why do we do it that way instead of your way? Because 20 years ago, the legislation was put into place where when people had to go into the embassies and hand in paper applications, it was more convenient to do it that way. They changed the law where People don't need to do that. Everything's submitted online, but they're still using the old system. Hmm. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can say why. Lack of leadership, lack of discussion, lack of public leadership debate. Leadership on whose behalf? Lack leadership on account of the department's behalf. We, we have a constant change of ministers. Those ministers have mandates that sometimes are, well, they're often politically driven, right? Who wants to talk about structural change? Say, we're gonna spend a billion dollars on structural change. That's not a sexy topic. A sexy topic is targets, hiring new workers. That you can sell in elections. So we've hit targets and we hired new workers. So I, w I grew up in Soviet Russia. We had lots of nuclear weapons, but as far as the sort of standard of life was pretty low. And we had Soviet cars, which were designed in Italy, then we took the designs and so on. RCC system is akin to like a Soviet car from the 70s, if you will. A lot of it. it not quite a lot. I'm a squidge. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it could drive reasonably straight under decent conditions and so on. But it, and just throwing money at it won't change. We need to change the underpinnings of the actual system. So if we're talking about reform, we need to look at structural changes. We've inherited a system that existed before the internet, before electronic applications mm -hmm. existed. My parents drove to an interview in Cairo, Egypt said hello to the officer, 
said, you know, I approve you, great. That no longer happens. So why are we relying on this system? Let me get Mikhail to comment on this as well. Does all, does all of this ring true with you? I thought I was cynical about all of this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not quite so cynical. The, the, you know, the, the system I pay most attention to because I am labor economist, I'm interested in the in the economics of immigration is the express entry system. That's a system that was introduced in January uh, 2015. I think it had a lot going for it. Notice I'm speaking about it in the past tense. It looks like there's a lot of changes coming to the express entry system. But but that was a new system. I think it was quite revolutionary. I mean, it was modeled off of some ideas in Australia and New Zealand. But um, I, I think it had a lot going for it. And, and I'm quite a fan of it. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, that that was kind of, we can talk about it more, but it was a system that essentially tied the government's hands, that you had a, a you know, a pool of applicants and the government just couldn't willy nilly go in and say, what, what attributes or what kinds of immigrants do we want this week? <laughs> We were just going to try to achieve an objective similar to similar to how the Bank of Canada's hands are tied, and and they're, they've given an inflation mandate. Um, so I, I I think that you know there were features of the system that were constantly evolving, um, and kudos to to IRCC and or CIC at the time for 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 those changes. But if you wanted to change what ails the system right now, in part to deal with the backlog, in part to deal with the technological problems in part to deal with the fact that a lot of people apparently weren't on the job during COVID, what would you do about that? Yeah, so there's no question. I, I don't want to take anything away from the other responses. There's no question there's potential for technological innovation at IRCC. Absolutely. Um, but I, I think the COVID and how the government politically responded to COVID, you know, their, their insistence to continue to hit these targets had a cost. It, it had a cost. And, and I think that's ultimately what I see as being the cause of this huge increase in the backlog. You know, the, the way this express entry system worked is that it wasn't a queue. It used to be in the old days, if you had a, if you hit the threshold on the point system, you were put in a queue and it was first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. The way the express entry system worked is it said, if you hit the threshold on the system, we're gonna put you in a pool. You don't, you don't, you know, you're not putting a queue, you're getting you're being put in an applicant pool. And every two weeks we're gonna go into that applicant pool and we're gonna cream skim. And so what that does is it 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 allows sort of the, the supply and demand to be equal from, you know, every two weeks. And so you don't have this big backlog. And so we were in a very nice steady state before March of 2020, before this pandemic hit. It, the system was working relatively well. There weren't big, the backlog wasn't growing for sure. Um, so that, that's something that's come out of this pandemic. Um, that's not an excuse for the IRCC, but um, it, it means that it was a political decision that was made. All right, let me circle back to something that I'm not sure we ever actually tackled this, the temporary resident to permanent resident pathway program. In your view, Elizabeth, how well does that work right now? I think the TR to PR was a reaction uh, to what was happening in the system. We, you know, in, in, in history of immigration, they had a huge division between people who had high-skilled work experience and low-skilled work experience. And during the pandemic, it was no longer about high-skilled or low-skilled, it was about essential work. We had people who were considered low-skilled, but who were essential workers. And for example, who would they be? For example, personal support workers. Um, so. Uh, basically, the government said, okay, we actually need to have a chance for these workers to also get permanent residence. We can't let them just leave the country. Um, and they also said, well, students also, were, the students are desperate um, and, and they need to. So it was a reaction to what was happening in the system. Great intentions, bad execution, because the government has a quota that they can only fill this amount of people for, uh, for each year. And what happened is by October of last year, the government said, uh-oh, we filled all of the quota for 2022 in October 2021, hmm. which is why there was a stop on draws for express entry until July of this year. What that meant was now the, the pool for express entry had been building up, building up. And as Mikhail has said, express entry is about skimming the cream. So you take the top 
of whoever's in the pool. Now, when you have an inventory, before usually there's a draw every two weeks, people can, uh, you know, you're, you're skimming the pool every two weeks. You haven't skimmed the pool for nine months since October, that cream is very, very it's thick. It's very thick, yes. Okay, and so as a result, um, the, the draws have been extraordinarily high. And so what happens is many people who would have other qualified for permanent residence, especially mm -hmm. international students who have studied, who have worked, and all of a sudden their work permits are going to expire, um, there's a big issue. Okay, do you want to comment on that or can I read you something? Well, yeah, I, I generally agree with what Elizabeth has said. I think I would add just one more thing. With TR to PR, there's, again, a lack of transparency in my mind. So most of what I've been doing for the last year is taking the government to court, essentially, on delayed applications with generally excellent results. However, people should not be paying lawyers to file an application for read and damas at the federal court to get the government to do its job. With TR to PR, We've done a few of those files, and we see that there's just no transparency with respect to when a file is going to be processed. The program was meant to be expedited, simplified, etc. We're seeing files that are already pending for 16 months with no end in sight. Those are supposed to be essential workers, healthcare workers, etc. How is that acceptable? That's all I would say on the TR to PR stuff. Okay, let me read this here, and then Mikhail, I'll get you to comment on this first because we've seen. Well, this is from. I want to read an excerpt from an article titled "When They Needed Us." They exploited us. This is Indian students in Canada. They made front page news of a major news in outlet in India last week. And here's an excerpt from this. I want to read this and then Mikhail, I'll get your reaction to it. The foreign graduates were hoping the permit extension would give them more time to gain Canadian work experience and boost their scores under the country's immigration ranking system for skilled workers. But these graduates got caught up in a backlog of applications that led to a 10-month shutdown of the system to allow the government to process them. Once the system was reopened, the students found themselves competing with pools of immigrants with much higher than normal scores, reducing their chances of gaining permanent residency. And obviously, they're very unhappy about that. Okay, Mikhail, your reaction to all of that? There's an equity problem, Steve. So the way what economists refer to this as is a horizontal equity system problem. In, in these kinds of systems, you want to ensure that people that are sort of equal are treated equally in the system. And, and what's happened here, again, as a consequence of, of trying to hit this target in 2021 and, and emptying the, the pool and then letting the pool fill up, is that we've got these very capable students. I mean, I teach a lot of these students, these international students. They would easily clear the bar. You know, that cream, where the, the cutoff is for the cream, they would easily clear that. But because the way Elizabeth described it is just perfect, um, the, the bar is now so much higher because that layer of cream has increased so much that these students who would have had, you know, no trouble clearing the bar in the past now can't. So what happens um, to so them? So th th that's a good question. So that they, they're given, three, in Canada, we give these students three-year open work permits. The question is, what happens to them when those permits end? And that's the troubling issue. Do they stay? Do they work without um, documentation, thereby potentially becoming more vulnerable to exploitation by employers? Mm -hmm. Do they try to go back home and get back on a pathway some other way? Do they go back to school? I mean, it's all about being on this pathway to permanent residency. And and so, yeah, I think, you know, it's the usual thing that, that these short-term myopic policy decisions often have long-term consequences. And, and we're seeing the fallout now. Now, Lev, it's obviously bad for them, but what about for the rest of the country? for What about for the people who, you know, how does it affect companies and employers? That kind of thing. Uh, in my experience, employers for big, well-established multinational companies generally do all right. Mm -hmm. They can uh, apply for LMIAs under the Global Talent Stream apply Program. Apply for what? For, excuse me, apply for a labor market impact assessment, mm -hmm. which is a document required in order to hire a non-Canadian. So uh, they can get that document fairly quickly under an expedited program. However, smaller businesses and maybe businesses in areas that are sort of more skilled trade based as opposed to technology or uh, finance, things like that, I think are generally struggling with a lot of red tape. And they're also being affected by the backlog because when they get the LMIA, one of the files we're doing now, one of the mandamuses, is for a welder who's coming into uh, 
Canadian company here. His work permit has been pending for nine months. So that company has made a decision to bring him on board because there's an obvious labor shortage. Mm -hmm. They're making certain plans as to when he will come to Canada so they can take on projects and so on. They're obviously not able to do that. And what is perhaps most egregious, there's no timeline for when something will be considered. With a foreign worker, may take a year if you're from India. So he's in limbo. May yeah, he's in limbo, the company's in limbo. So the big employers, I think, are doing relatively okay. A lot of red tape could still be cut. Smaller employers, certain industries, I think, are struggling. And I think we need to go beyond the sort of bureaucratic, technocratic framework, bring in stakeholders, and then the system will become fair and more transparent that will benefit both the employees and the workers. Okay. Lee, you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, a few things to add. Number one, the government has uh, sort of had a temporary solution for uh, students. They have uh, brought in a policy which allows students whose uh, work firms are about to expire um, this year to extend it for 18 months. So that helps out a little bit. That's not the end of the solution because we don't know whether or not they can get permanent residence you know, within the next 18 months or not. Um, I think the struggle, though, is across the board. Big, big employers, small employers, everybody's waiting at the visa post for, you know, nine months, ten months, who knows when. That affects our economy. We are right now in competition with the rest of the world for the, the cream. Not just, a, you know, what we think of as... CEOs and tech workers, but also just workers in general, healthcare workers, essential workers. We are, you know, in desperate need of workers. Um, and I think, um, in terms of the the solution to this, I I disagree in terms of thinking that express entry is the cat's. Uh, the, the bee's knees with regard to uh, with regard to immigration. I think it's it's okay if we're ta talking about workers who we want to bring in, who we want to select, who are outside of the country. Yes, they don't have any ties to Canada. Okay, fine, we select the cream from outside of the country. But workers who are in Canada, who are already working, we know they're needed. Why are we still saying you're not good enough? to stay. You're good enough to work, you're not good enough to stay. I think we need a different system for workers who are in Canada to allow each and every one of them, if they can prove that they are needed in Canada, to stay and get permanent residence. Well, we put some of these issues to IRCC, and here's what they responded back. We got this email in response. The government's response outlines a range of existing pathways to be expanded or adjusted to increase opportunities to transition from temporary to permanent residents, strengthen Canada's ability to meet a wide range of labor needs and address long-term labor shortages, and support regional needs as well as communities across the country. In addition, beginning on November 16, 2022, the National Occupational Classification will expand pathways to permanent residency for temporary workers and international students and allow more occupations to become eligible for the programs managed under express entry. Mikhail, let me get you to react to that. <laughs> I could talk a long time about this, Steve, but I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. You know, the, the, the analogy is the same one I, I gave before. The, the beauty of the express entry system is it tied the government's hands. What's going to happen now is that employers, you're going to see a, a huge increase in the amount of business lobbying going on. So every employer who wants their certain type of occupation uh, to, be, to be filled will be lobbying the government for the next express entry draw to prioritize the workers they need. Um, and so lobbying is going to increase and we're going to lose sight of what the objective is. The objective here is to boost GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. Roughly two thirds of GDP are immigrants, are, are, are people's earnings. So what the CRS does, and this is the part most people don't recognize, the points in the comprehensive ranking system, how we, how we rank people in this express entry pool, is based entirely on a statistical model that predicts immigrants' earnings in the first 10 years in Canada. And so if we now move away to prioritize something else, there's going to be a compromise there. And if we know anything about the economics of Canadian immigration, we know that Canada really struggles in immigrant selection. Canadian immigrants, when you compare them to other immigrants in other countries from this, you know, you compare university educated immigrants in the US um, from India, they outperform US born workers, 
outperform. Their earnings are about 20% higher on average. You look at Indian immigrants in Canada, the university educated, their earnings are about 20% lower. So there's an issue about immigrant selection. And now I don't see how this is ever going to address those problems. Well, in addition to everything we've just talked about, the government of Canada has now said that it wants to increase the number of immigrants we bring into this country to a target of 500,000 by the year 2025. So we've got this backlog in place that we're at the moment not handling, and we want to actually increase by what, 100,000, 150,000? To 500,000 within three years. Is that doable? I think it's doable. I think in terms of if they get, get their act together, they have a more efficient system, absolutely. And we need immigrants. We um, need them, but we can't seem to process them quickly enough to get them in here. Right now, if they change the system, I, I, I think they could certainly, you know, I mean, if you think about, if, just for example, for, for fees alone, each immigrant is paying around $2,000 for fees just to have the privilege of someone evaluating their application. Mm -hmm. Surely we can hire people who um, would be able to uh, assess these applications properly. Do you think there's any way to get up to 500,000 within three years? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's a way to get uh, to hit targets. The question is, are we going to do this in a humane and procedurally fair way? Mm -hmm. Um, are we going to, again, look at systemic changes and so on? And this is where I disagree a bit with Mikhail, or at least we have to sort of get our definitions right. Uh, Express entry was working relatively well. It wasn't working well for international students who were excluded, generally speaking, or at least didn't have the right to apply, as Elizabeth said. Previously, they applied under the Canadian Experience class as of right, without having to get invited. And we were failing skilled trade workers. Other than that, it was working reasonably well. My problem with the express entry, however, is the, the allocation of points for people who have Canadian work experience, for people who are already working, for people who are already here. I think those factors should be given more uh, importance, if you will, than, mm -hmm. for example, having a fantastic language score. You can manipulate it with language. Um, and I think the backlog on the express entry side of things is relatively small. They'll, they'll work through it. But work permits, for example, big backlogs. Students, backlogs exist there. Um, Things like the living caregiver or whatever the new program is called, uh, Elizabeth Nick sort of doesn't doesn't come to mind now. So we can certainly hit those numbers. The question is, how do we hit them? At what cost? And what the government is going to do, which is something they always do, it's a sort of a classic move. Don't look over here, the backlog. Everybody who is applied in June of 2020 is going to get their PR within six months, so that when the election campaign comes, etc., so hit hit targets. Those who are still Panting, just don't look over here. We're doing a mandamus right now for um, so a federal court application for an investor, Quebec investor, 68 months of processing. I've done a couple of citizenship, citizenship applications, Syrian, Iranian nationals, five years of processing. Hmm. Within 60 days, they're approved. So we need to look at not just the numbers, but the system, as I've said before. And I think we need public consultation, we need transparency, and we need to make sure that going forward, because Canada, as it's currently construed as a nation of immigrants, we have a system that doesn't just hit targets, hit numbers, but keeps in mind economic priorities, but also does it in a way that is humane to the people who are choosing to live here. All right, we got a couple of minutes to go here, and I want to pick up on something you just said. I, I think every poll I have seen out of the United States recently on people's impressions towards increasing immigration are very negative. Most Americans, and particularly most Republicans, do not want to see immigration levels increased. And yet, Elizabeth, I'll go to you first on this. A recent poll by Enveronics Institute and the Century Initiative found Canadian support for immigration seems to be at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. Why do you think? You know, the, the kind of immigrants that we have in this country is quite different uh, from the U.S. The U.S., I think they're mainly concerned about the illegal immigrants the crossing southern border. Yeah. The, the southern border. Mm -hmm. For the most part, our immigrants are coming here under express entry, under the economic programs. And just to give you an idea of how skilled you have to be to get to be the cream where you're selected for express entry, you're mostly in your 20s. By the time you're 30s, your scores start dropping. 45, you're done. Forget it. Zero <laughs> compared to 100. You're looking at two degrees, 
usually one with a master's, you're looking at fluency of English or French at such a high level that I have people whose only language is English or French who often bomb the exams, <laughs> okay? Um, and so you have three years of high-skilled work experience um, outside of the country or at least one year of high-skilled work experience inside the country and studying inside. So these people are extraordinary who we are bringing into the country. Thus, public opinion is more on their side. Our, you, we can see our economy is rising because of the, mm. the immigrants that we're bringing in. Let me give McCall uh, the last word on this. McC uh, why do you think it's so different between here and what they say in the United States? I think Elizabeth is right. In order to have strong public support for an immigration system, you need that immigration system to work well. And the fact that we don't have porous borders and we can control the immigration system through a point system, like the express entry system, is a huge part of the success and the continuing support. Now, you know, the, the idea, I, you know, I have to come back to the, this idea that immigration you know, is so critical for the economy. There's a lot of hyperbolic rhetoric coming from the immigration department these days. Um, it, it, you know, you ask any Canadian economist who studies Canadian immigration, there's a group of us in Canada, not one of them believes that immigration has this big positive effect on economic growth. That does not mean that we shouldn't have immigration. I'm an immigrant. I, I'm definitely very pro-immigration. But the rhetoric around, you know, the idea that there are these labor market needs that need to be filled, that's a completely perverse way of thinking about how an economy works. You know, labor demand and the jobs that we do are largely driven by the labor supply. If you look at how grapes are picked in the wine industry in, in California, you know, they have porous borders and a lot of unskilled migration. So they're the jobs that apparently are needed are, you know, lower skilled workers. In Australia, where that porous border isn't there, those grapes are picked by machines. So the fact is the jobs we have are what we say endogenous to lots of factors, including the labor supply. If you want a low-skilled economy with low wages, then increase the amount of low-skilled immigration. If you want a high-skilled economy with high-skilled workers and high wages, then focus and pri prioritize high-skilled workers. It, it really is that simple, Steve. That's Mikhail Skuderud from the University of Waterloo. <laughs> My thanks to him, along with Elizabeth Long and Lev Abramovich, immigration lawyers, we're grateful for your time tonight here on TVO. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.